and welcome back to the 2020 Kids Brain Health Network Virtual Conference. I am your host, Dr. Brian Goldman, from the CBC radio programs, White Coat Black Art and The Dose, uh, which is a CBC podcast. Our next session will get you thinking about the people we do this research for. Uh, it's one that I've been looking forward to since the beginning of the conference. It's sponsored by uh, Can FASD. Luke's Legacy Lecture is a memorial tribute to Luke Martins, a young man who inspired authenticity and excellence in family engagement in research. Uh, sadly, Luke died this past August, just a few weeks before his 14th birthday. But today, we carry on his legacy. I want to turn things over now to co-moderators Donna Thompson, Pat Board Vice Chair for KBHN, and Connie Putterman, uh, founder of the of the Canada Israel Autism Research Institute, who are also co-developers and co-instructors of the Family Engagement in Research for course. We are the Canada FASD Research Network, your source for trusted evidence-based information about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. FASD is Canada's leading developmental disability. We work together to improve supports for Canadians with FASD. Learn more at www.canfasd.ca. Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Brian. It's such a pleasure to be here with my, my friend and my colleague, Connie Putterman. Uh, today, Luke's Legacy Lecture is a memorial tribute to the life of Luke Martins, who graced this world with his presence from August 26, 2006 to August 9, 2020. Uh, the son of Rachel and Nick Martins, Luke was a boy who inspired authenticity and excellence in family engagement in research. His tenacity and love of life reminds us of why we speak, seek answers to childhood disability challenges in science together. And Rachel is with us here today as well. That's a beautiful image of, of Luke right there. Um, and if we go to the, the next slide, we'll tell you a little bit about um, today's uh, uh, objectives and explain a little bit about the Family Engagement in Research course um, at CanChild, funded by Kids Brain Health Network. And today we're going to explore the role and impact of family research partnership uh, from family co-leads and family graduates of the Family Engagement in Research course. You're going to meet some of our, our panelists and parent partners in just a moment. Uh, so we're going to introduce the content of the Family Engagement in Research course. We're going to hear from three family graduates and we're going to hold a panel discussion. Uh, after, uh, after which you'll be able to ask questions. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. So, um, next slide. And I, I, uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, some of the graduates. You're going to meet them in video testimonials now. for disability research. The reason why we call today's lecture Luke's Legacy Thank you for joining us here today for Luke's Legacy Lecture. I wanted to take a moment to introduce you to myself and a bit about my family. My name is Rachel Martins and I'm a research engagement strategist for Kids Brain Health Network and Canchild Center for Disability Research. The reason why we call today's lecture Luke's Legacy Lecture is this was a wonderful tribute to my son who passed away in August. This here 
is Luke. Luke was the reason that um, I got into being a partner on research to begin with. Um, my experiences with him really translated into a lot of facets of uh, who I wanted to be. He was a kid who demanded a lot of attention, um, in, not just in the usual way, but in ways where he felt he really recognized his sense of worth. Um, if you weren't paying attention to something that he was engaged in, he made sure that you you were brought into to understand the value of the moment that we were in right now. Um, he had a big he was a big fan of the movie Moana, not the whole movie, but just one specific song upon which we would listen to over and over and over again. And if you weren't as excited as he was to listen to who in his mind was the song of the angel, he would literally take your your face and bring it towards you so you could or towards himself so he could actually help you to understand what it means to live in the moment and that was something that encompassed so much of his life was um demanding to live in the moment and to live fully and i think that that really um translated into a lot of the work that um I, i've done over the years as a partner in research is that um I really felt like the opportunity to be a partner was really about understanding why um, I was wanting a seat at the table when it comes to research projects where I wanted to share his story, not my story. Um, I wasn't planning on being his voice. I wanted to be a microphone for him. And so I was just, I was offered a lot of wonderful opportunities to be a part of studies. And though we miss him every day, um, we wanted to have this opportunity, was offered this wonderful opportunity to uh, bring you a little, to a little bit about the family engagement research course and understanding that his memory is what a lot of families, um, uh, reflects a lot of what families go through in terms of how and, re and why they get connected in research. Because it's not just um, a tick box on a grant application. It's about finding meaning in the formation of full lives for our kids and for the carers as well to find meaning in ourselves and who we are. So please enjoy the time that you have here today as we talk about um, the finer details of the course and things like that. Thank you again for your, the opportunity to share a little bit of my family here with you today. Such thank a passionate, so much. yeah, thank you, Rachel. So passionate. So we wanna talk a little bit uh, today about the Family Engagement and Research course and uh, begin by saying, you know, really looking at why is this training needed? So uh, early on, um, Connie, Andrea Cross uh, from Canchild and I uh, worked together because we all identified a need um, within our constituency of childhood disability research um, for training uh, in family engagement in research. And we, uh, this is borne out by a paper by Snape um, in 2014. So it's a relatively new phenomenon, um, this type of research. Uh, but we knew that we wanted um, to explore it further. We knew that there was uh, a need for training both in parent partners and in researchers. And researchers were reporting an overwhelming need and interest in supports for this work um, and how to access funding and training for it to effectively engage uh, patients and the public in health research. And that's from Crockett, 2019. And it's interesting to just quickly review where did this all begin at Kids Brain Health Network? So this is the history um, of these activities as far as the network is concerned. Um, the first thing that happened very early on uh, in 2014 was there was a launch of the Parents Partnering in Research Facebook group. 
and there was a family engagement day held that year. Then um, moving onwards, we had uh, a, a, conf a conference that included a family engagement day in 2016. Uh, there was a request for um, applications uh, in 2017 uh, for work that supported these activities. Big conference in 2017 where a lot of talk and a lot of energy was put into these, this work, the family engagement. There were parents at that conference and Connie and Andrea sat down and really hammered out uh, with some specificity, our plans um, to create the family engagement and research course. And we, we started it in 2018. And in 2020, um, we uh, are going to launch later in the year, um, a leadership academy, which is going to be, uh, it's fantastic. Keep your ears and eyes open for more news on the Leadership Academy. We're really excited about it. So the Family Engagement and Research Certificate of, Commu of Completion from McMaster University Department of Continuing Education is an online 30-hour uh, course um, with, uh, an assess with assessments. Um, it's run in partnership between KBHN, CanChild, and the McMaster Centre for Continuing Ed. And this is, the, this is the really important bit. We create a cohort of family members and researchers who are uh, really passionate about working together um, to create uh, a new way of influencing both what is researched, how it's researched for, for uh, collectively, working collectively for impact uh, in Canada on the lives of children with disabilities and their families. So everybody working together on, on our course is invested in contributing to and ready to engage. That's the thing. We do both the theory and the practice of working together in pairs or small groups of parents working with researchers. And, um, you know, we want people to graduate from the course and they do ready to uh, be able to work with confidence in this way. Uh, we talk a lot about power dynamics in these, uh, in these groups but we really know that people are able to overcome their nerves, fears, whatever barriers they may feel personally at the beginning and develop a level of confidence in which everyone is a contributor on the research team. And people feel capable and confident to engage with each other at every stage of the research process. So to date, uh, we have 98 graduates and 34 are currently uh, taking the course and 35 are enrolled for the winter um, of 2021. And I hope that wasn't your slide, Connie, was it? <laughs> You're doing great, Donna. So um, I think, uh, but I'm happy to, to dive in a little bit deeper about our graduates and Dawn has given you a really good overview of the goals and the history of the course, the context of the course. So just to give you really a snapshot of who's taking our course or so we, this is a breakdown of our family graduates to date. Um, and as you can see, we've got um, 49 uh, family members so far who've graduated and you can see that they're mostly parents, but we've got, as well a sibling and grandparent, and they come from really across the country, um, at, mostly in Ontario, but we're spread out. And we've really accommodated, uh, during the synchronous sessions, we really accommodate um, our grads who are coming from across the nation. We also have had some family members uh, internationally from the US and the Netherlands. So that gives you a snapshot of family grads. Now, on the researcher graduate side, we have the same number of researcher graduates, but you can see that it's broken up. We've really broken it up by um, the various positions they hold, and they range from the students, uh, postdocs, 
uh, coordinators, early, mid-career uh, researchers, master's level, retired professors, a real whole gamut of people that we are attracting on the researcher side. And again, um, from across Canada, nationally, you know, mostly in Ontario, but we've, we've also uh, spanned the, the country um, in, ter in terms of other provinces. On the international front, we really attracted as well um, researchers from around the globe. And we're really proud to say and look at this, this international impact that we've also had in, in, in um, researchers who've attended from across the globe. So there's a snapshot for you. So really giving you some details about how we run this course. You know, it's over a series of 10 weeks. Um, most of it is asynchronous, but we run three to four synchronous sessions where we're all live together. We go through in the first part that really the what is family engagement and research and dive into the meaning and why it's important. Um, and we build the foundations for everybody to really understand family engagement and research in the first few weeks. Um, we talk about practicalities of how we work together, how we find each other, um, and particularly for researchers and families who may not be already associated with um, organizations, particularly family members who, who don't necessarily uh, are attached to organizations. We talk about roles and responsibilities as well and how you manage through the research process to have impact. Um, in the middle of the sessions we get, of the 10 weeks, we get into ethics, and this is always a juicy uh, topic, and we could talk for sessions upon sessions about ethics, as you all know in the audience, what a difficult conversation that can be, and we really um, dive deeply into that. Um, and then in the last few weeks, we go through barriers and facilitators, and this kind of is a thread throughout. In the last few weeks, we really um, look at evaluation activities, tools, and resources that are, are much more practical. And then how we actually do this and next steps and how do we build the community and how do we then, us as a, as a program, support the, the community of, of cohorts that we've, um, we've, been, we've been instructing. So over the 10 weeks, it's quite intense. Um, and, uh, but I think that the, the, that intensity also brings a really nice bonding and sharing between people who are taking the course. One of the things that happens throughout the course, and it, it actually happens early on, is that we as an instruct, instructor's team pair up with a pair of the family member with a researcher, and they go throughout the entire 10 weeks and develop a student project. Um, it's a knowledge translation project, and it's meant to be a tool that, that is somehow going to aid um, in, in family engagement and research in various aspects. So to date, we have produced 45 knowledge translation tools, um, and they are really worth having a look at. I would really suggest that you, after this session, that you go on to the CanChild website um, and you see the, the web uh, address uh, at the bottom um, on the FER course and you will see all the tools there. And they are fantastic. We are so proud to have been able to um, uh, see the work of our students and what they can produce in trying to help further along a family engagement in research uh, uh, program. They, they, they really do get it by the end. So just as Donna has, has shown you the bar graphs earlier, to date we've got 98 graduates and there's a 94 retention rate amongst all of, all, uh, uh, of the, the people that we have taken on, which is a great retention rate um, for over, those, over that, co that cohort. Um, currently, we've got 69 researchers and family members taking the course this year. So... At the end of the, in the next spring, we'll have well over 165 graduates. And the last, the last point that you might be interested in is that there's such a high level of satisfaction 
at 8.6%. And one of the things that we are doing is gathering data, um, beginning, middle, at, and end, um, and uh, interviewing our, our students to really understand the impact that the course is having on them. So we're really proud of those, those statistics. So we're going to now um, bring you to the point of uh, hearing from some family graduates of ours. So um, I, I want to introduce, uh, there's Ali, Jamie, and Francine, and um, we will be showing uh, some videos that they've put together. And then we've asked them during in those videos why they took the course, what they learned, what they're doing now with respect to family engagement and research, and what their goals are for the future. So we're going to hear from Ali, Jamie, and Francine, and then afterwards we're going to bring them back to have a discussion with them. Why did you choose to get involved with the Family Engagement in Research course? Well, I am the mom to two amazing twins that are little girls and they were born at 26 weeks and we were looking for services. We were looking for support and I didn't know where to go. I didn't really know what was beneficial for us or what would help our family. And so I started kind of reaching out a little bit and I, I found a few research groups and a few parent connection groups. And through them, I eventually found my way to the families engaged in research. And once I had done that, I realized that I, I could learn something from this and it would enable me as a parent to know where to reach out and where the supports would be for us. So I started the course and enjoyed it. And it was a lot of reading. And once I, I really had about a week into it, I, I genuinely started to connect with what I was reading and the research initiative and the family centered engagement and the individualized care. And it, it kind of sparked something in me and it enabled me to help my children. So, going through the course as I moved forward I found that I was more and more interested in the process and I was more interested in becoming more of a, a bridge to care and a bridge to service and one of the ways that I could do that was through knowledge translation and supports so taking the families engaged in research course really enabled me to know where I fit in in the medical community and where I fit in in my child's care and where I fit in in progress and research. And it turns out I have a place and it's phenomenal. The course has enabled me to move forward. It has provided me with information and research document that allowed me to realize that I genuinely belong here. Lived experience is incredibly important to care. It is individualized and you're not going to find my individualized care in any book. And the ability to connect and enable myself, my children and my team was really phenomenal. Once I finished the course, I very much wanted to move forward. I very much wanted to continue my education through McMaster and I very much wanted to implement some kind of standard of care and connection to research and appropriateness and, and basically just supports and resource that any individual requires. So before taking the family engagement and research course, I'd already worked as a parent advisor on a couple of projects and I've read a lot of journal articles and websites in the subject. So I was already familiar with kind of the history behind it and the values, but I also know because I would worked on a couple of projects that each team does things a little bit differently. And I know that I felt a little bit different um, with each team that I was working with. So sometimes I would feel great and other times I would feel, I don't know, maybe used is the right word. Um, so I wanted to take the course because I wanted to see if other people felt the same way I did. And maybe we can make those feelings go away for future patient advisors and partners. So I was really interested in kind of hearing the other side of the story from researchers. I chose to get involved with the research course because I wanted to gain a better understanding of the 
different steps of a research project and how things come together and what type of role I wanted to learn more about the kind of um, support role I could take um, in a research project. I wanted to understand better um, how they use the information and how they gather the information and I really didn't understand um, all the ins and outs of um, uh, the criteria to be um, selected for a research project and I really wanted to learn more about how those processes take place. What have you learned from taking the course? What I learned from the Families Engagement Research course was first of all my own place in my child's role or excuse me my child's care in my care and in our support system. I learned that it was incredibly important that I knew my rights are rights and that I had the ability to connect with our team and that if I ever needed to reach out, I had other areas of doing it. The other thing though that I, I learned from this course and that really substantiated everything for me was the fact that there seems to be a real, or there is a real lack of support or bridge or networking, whatever the word is that you want to call it, um, there's a lack of support when it comes to individualized care, families, and research. It has been made to be believed that research is something that is out of our hands and that it's a very large process and we have no part in it. We just hear about it at the end. Um, the truth is, is that our individualized care, our individual life experiences pave the road for research and pave the road for initiatives and basically pave the road for movement and to know that there needs to be something in there to help and assist individuals who wish to have that connection to research. So the family engagement and research course really enabled me to understand that I can have a family-centered equalitarian approach to the care that I do in nonprofit and the care that I have with my kids and that when I connect in the community and when I connect as a mom there are other ways that I can do that that will really bridge the gaps between our medical community, our teams, researchers, developers, stakeholders. Everybody has a piece and everybody matters. Some of us feel that we don't matter because we're the ones telling our, our sad stories all the time or our heartfelt lived experiences. But your lived experience, my lived experience, those things pave the way for how science progresses. And if we don't introduce ourselves and connect with the major research facilities that are trying to move forward and major researchers that are trying to move forward with initiatives and in ways that are going to improve our lives, we'll never have that individualized care. It'll always be an umbrella, so pardon me, umbrella care that isn't standardized or individualized, it's just generalized. And not everybody can connect to that. Having that gap filled by people and individuals who are genuinely interested in the connection to research and progress is really important. And that's where I kind of found the gap and decided to fill it. And then I found that I wasn't the only person that felt that way, there was actually a phenomenal network of people who are genuinely trying to bridge the gap between, gap between service, research, and stakeholder. It's incredibly important that the resources and connections are there because they support the individual and they support the science. I think the coolest thing that I learned um, was the challenges that researchers have in doing patient engagement. And I also think that was the coolest thing about the course, like actually sitting down and working with researchers. Um, I learned it's not that easy to fit patient engagement into your everyday research work that you're doing. Um, sometimes timelines are too short. Sometimes, uh, you know, it getting the feedback doesn't come as quickly as you'd like, um, things like that. So they have challenges too, as much as we might have challenges in uh, getting our feedback across. So I think it was really cool to have two sides because I think relationships really come out of this and having the relationships, the start of that relationship um, in this course um, 
was a great aspect of it. So I learned from the other side, I guess would be my answer. Um, I've learned a lot of things. I've learned about um, the criteria required for different people to be involved in research projects and why and how they make the selections based on um, what type of information they're trying to gather. I've learned that um, I could be a really active member of a research team. I could be a subject in a research project and be fairly passive with my engagement. It's really up to me how much I want to do. And I've also learned a lot of um, lingo, jargon, and very technical terms that I had no idea what they meant. And um, I learned that despite the fact that I think that uh, um, research is super cool, it's, it's not as widely used as I would have liked to have thought it would. What interesting projects are you up to now? I have been very, very lucky that I have found an amazing community of people who have the same ideas that I have and have not only substantiated those ideas, they've implemented them and are moving forward with amazing projects. I have been very, very lucky to be able to move forward with knowledge translation and research initiative. And I've been able to work with the Envisage team through CanChild and um, I do a lot of networking and supports to the Cerebral Policy Canada Network. I'm the national coordinator and I'm very proud to be able to share resourcing and research initiative support and opportunities for people nationally. Um, I genuinely am very proud of having been a part of the program in the beginning and to be able to move forward with several different initiatives. I work with the University of Alberta. I have, I'm not even sure how to say this. I mean, I, I have been very blessed to have been welcome to some amazing communities that have opportunities available to individuals like me who genuinely wish to move forward. And it's not about ego and it's not about remuneration. It's, it's genuinely about connection and supports. And I've been able to do that. I, I could probably sit here for an hour and, and really discuss the initiatives and amazing groups and networks that I've been a part of. I've been very blessed and very lucky to have an amazing network. The last thing that I did was um, World Cerebral Palsy Day. We had uh, an amazing meet with CPNet for their Science and Family Day. And it was phenomenal to be able to connect on that level with major program providers and service providers here in Canada. Um, and nationally and internationally as well. I've been very, very blessed. And I'm, I'm very green. I'm very much starting at the bottom and am very, very much looking forward to the next 10, 20 years of my career in research and, and where it's going to take me. I've had the opportunity to keep on working on a number of great projects. Um, one that I'm most proud of is a project that uh, I've started with just after I completed the Family Engagement and Research course. And I had the opportunity to start right from the beginning with the study team, bring the question together um, and work as part of the research team right from the ground up. Um, and it's been really exciting and hopefully soon I'll be able to share a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, but the other exciting thing actually is that um, as of about a year ago, I was hired on as the patient engagement coordinator for research um, at SickKids. And it's been great to use what I've learned in the family engagement and research course and apply it to improving the practical work, that day-to-day -day work that goes into supporting um, patient engagement across a number of research teams, not just um, one or two. Um, and I think having that personal experience of being a family advisor um, and also kind of understanding the research side has helped my role at Sick Kids because I can see the challenges from both sides and then really help on removing those barriers um, that both sides have and hopefully growing patient engagement um, into the future. Some more teams are doing it and there's more advisors out there doing it. Um, now I am involved um... I've recently, uh, our family, my son and I have been uh, subjects in a research study about 
um, tracking um, emotional, um, what's the right word, expressions um, that he uses to communicate different messages to the people around him. And it was pretty neat. Um, I spent a couple hours uh, with the research project manager, I think is the right term. And uh, she interviewed family members and I got to send her pictures and we got to talk about a lot of things and we ended up um, having some really great conversations and it hardly felt like we were being studied, which was really neat. And um, just this week I've said yes to um, being part of a focus group that is going to um, collect some data about the experience of medically complex families in, um, who access home care um, in the context of a pandemic. And it's an international study. Um, we're going to be interacting with families from the UK and Ireland, as well as uh, the US and Canada. And um, I'm really, really excited because it hits really close to home. We're a family that accesses home care. And in the pandemic, we've had a really difficult time finding any good direction. So I'm, I'm just so excited to be a part of this project. The end result of the project um, aims to be a set of best practice guidelines or recommendations. And um, we're also going to seek some accreditation, though I don't fully understand how that process will happen at this time. Do you have any goals or aspirations for the future? Well, where I see myself in the future is to have had a substantiated, equalitarian, equalized approach to care. Individualized care is incredibly important and having the resources and support that you need and access that you need to provide yourself the ability to move forward is incredibly important. My role, I think, is to be that that bridge of connection that knowledge translation that resource that research connection i think those things are incredibly important they're imperative to one's care i have two children with two completely different levels of cerebral palsy and yet they're identical twins but they're different in every way their care is different what they require is different it, it's individualized if we have the support the individualized care requires, then it will enable individuals living through their stress, their grief, their best of everything. Enabling individuals makes progress happen. Having progress enables the community. And why wouldn't we want to enable? Moving forward is incredibly difficult and we're all struggling. If we weren't struggling, what would be the point? But it's having that connection and access and resource and support. Not everyone needs the same thing, but somebody asking obviously has need. I want to be there to ensure that your needs are met. And if you need access to research, we can provide straight governance and support so that your rights are taken care of, your family, you are supported and you will receive what you need. We can connect you. That's what I see, and that's what I'd like to be. I genuinely wish to be the bridge to research and equalitarian-centered care. I would love to be able to connect more researchers and family advisors in whatever capacity I'm in. I think there's a lot of challenges in connecting the right people together. Healthcare and research, it's always been a place um, that values patient privacy, which is rightly so, right? But sometimes that can make it challenging for family members who want to be made aware of projects um, or clinicians that are trying to look for family advisors. That kind of um, patient privacy puts up that barrier. So figuring out how to work around that so that both sides um, feel comfortable sharing what they're comfortable sharing and that we can work hard for patient advisors to get access to different projects and build on the skills that they've gained, say in project one or two, and then bring that to project three. I think there's a real value in building skills of patient advisors and then sharing those skills so that we're not just always looking for fresh advisors, but we have experienced advisors that can teach new advisors and bring them along. 
I'd also love to have more opportunities for researchers and um, family advisors to meet in a more informal kind of environment. Um, I think it's really important, um, maybe post COVID, to meet face to face and have that opportunity to have a conversation. Um, I've always said the good partnership comes from good relationships and relationships that start with a good conversation are always the best kind of relationships. I would love to be a paid team member on a research team. I would love to be able to feel like I am managing all the aspects of my life well enough that I could seek a career. Um, currently, um, within the realm of the pandemic, it's very difficult to um, add too much to my plate at a time because I'm kind of on my own with a lot of management of Jacob's care and carrying out of his care, as well as um, his public education, um, any therapeutic interventions, we can get support virtually but the hands-on stuff is all me. So I guess my goal would be to get a job. <laughs> well, it's just so wonderful to hear from all of our, or some of our um, uh, student cohorts and the, the, the testimonials were so rich and so inspiring to hear that what we want to do now is bring them all to you live here and have a panel discussion with some questions that we've put together um, for our panel members. So we've got Rachel and Francine, um, Jamie and Ali. Um, we want to welcome you to the discussion and thank you all for that wonderful, uh, that, those wonderful testimonials. So we've got some questions for you. Um, the first one that I wanted to pose, and maybe I'm going to ask Ali to, to tackle this, that what, what successes and challenges have you had with family engagement in research and was that what you've encountered? Do you want to go into that a little deeper? Um, the successes are that I've learned things about myself and about the research process and how to be a, a team member on a research project. Some of the challenges have been um, kind of internal for me. Um, I needed to believe in myself and challenge myself. Um, there was a lot of literature available to me throughout the course, different research papers to take a look at how they presented the information. And I really struggled with my confidence about being able to um, read a research paper um, with the lack of post-secondary education and, and maybe not as broad of um, understanding of the different terms and stuff. And when I got um, overwhelmed enough, I believe I reached out either to Donna or Connie or maybe both of them and said hey I think I'm in over my head maybe I'm not the right candidate and I got the best pep talk of my life and um and I needed it because I didn't think that I was enough which is a theme in my life but that's another story um and being a part of this course really gave me a chance to challenge myself challenge my own definition of what I was capable of doing and what I had to offer and I also um, kind of got rid of some of my illusions about research papers term terminology um, big education and 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 people who spend you know 15 20 years getting it educated all of that stuff has really been intimidating to me throughout my life and um, that was a big challenge for me to overcome in interacting with this course. And um, I was so grateful that there, there uh, was so many approachable um, ladies like Donna and Connie available to me to, to support me in that process. Yeah, th thank you, Ali, for that. I really, um, I, I, I really think it's a really important topic that you're talking about, this whole demystification of research to family members that it it seems like it's done in another place and that there's no place for for families in it but yet there is a place and that's the whole goal of our course is to uh for people to find their voices and gain that that confidence to have that that confidence to know that you too your perspective 
um, really does matter. So I'm really glad you said something to you, 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 you know, you talked about that because it's such a big issue and we need, and we continue to address that issue in our course throughout every cohort that we're, that we're teaching. We talk about this as a, as a really big issue. Um, so I've got another question and maybe I will, I will ask, um, uh, the others on this question. So in, in your roles and, and you really did give us a lot of, of, uh, opportunity to understand where you're going now, what changes do you think are needed? And maybe, you know, in family engagement and research, as you're out there doing your thing, um, and what strategies do you think um, are needed to support family engagement in re research that's meaningful? Like what, what, what strategies? So it's kind of a two part question, but really where, where do you see some of those uh, areas of improvement? Um, maybe I'll ask Francine first um, and then, and then Jamie, I'll ask you to comment on that too. Personally, I would like to see patient engagement be more embedded into institutional processes. So either at an institution or at a team level, but really thinking about how the work you do is continuous, you are constantly engaging with patients and families, and it becomes second nature and natural. And, you know, I try to think of it like I'm um, going to a theme park, right? Like when you go to a theme park, you're only on a ride for like a couple of minutes and you stand in line for the rest of the time. But if you go to a theme park, you're being entertained, you're engaged, they're keeping things going and exciting. And then when you leave the theme park, you want to go back again. And I want people to think of patient engagement as that. How do you keep patients and families interested in the research you're doing in all those times and gaps where you're just sitting and waiting for an REB to come back or for the data to get collected. That's what I, I envision um, happening or that's what I would like to happen. Um, I think for that to happen, the strategies, I think resources are important. You need to invest in the resources for the people to keep people engaged and invest their time and energy in how to be innovative in that. Um, so I think we need to rely not just on the patients, but all on the institutions and the organizations to figure out how to support that continuous engagement. And, and just on that note, uh, Francine, how, how do you keep it authentic? You know, how do you ensure authenticity? I think that's also a challenge, you know, to be able to do this in an institution and to get buy-in, but how do you maintain that authenticity? That's maybe an open-ended question. Yeah, but I have a quick answer to that. I think authenticity comes with relationships. And if you start to build those relationships and you make it continuous, you will automatically become authentic because it will become second nature. So I think we just need to start. And if you continue it and you push it, it will become authentic. That, that's really great. And as we know, it's the foundation of family engagement and research is trusted relationships. So thank you for saying that. And maybe I'll turn it over to Jamie to, to also answer that question. Well, I think that um, if I could be incredibly honest, what we need is a bridge in service. And we need that bridge between everyone, the individual and the service, whether it's research and research is so spectral. There are so many different people we can connect to on that. But to just have a non anything, just a bridge waiting for you for service, whatever you need, non-denominational, I have all the resources or whomever, I think that's imperative because that way everyone has access to that. There's no question, there's no confusion, there's no wasted time. You as a professional, stakeholder, individual, parent, caretaker, whomever you are, if you have access to that bridge to service, you have access to what you need and individualizing that care is imperative. Having a bridge, so to speak, for anyone to you know, connect allows them to do it on their level. If you just require resources in regard to something that's happened, that's something that be, can be connected to you. If you just have a few questions in regard to research in your situation, that can easily be connected to you. 
However, if your life experience and your lived experience of the moment really calls for you to have more answers and more questions and more of a gap, then that bridge needs to be filled so that you have the service that you need and service providers aren't wasting their time, their finances, their energy on things that could very easily be remedied with a very quick bridge to service and allow them access where they actually need to go. So it sounds like when you say bridge, it's really invest an investment in maybe people, resources, tools, uh, things like that, that would allow uh, family engagement and research to flow more easily to, to be able to help families. Absolutely. Um, having a standardized engagement, whatever, whatever that name will be, but a standardized engagement for community so that whatever community it is that you are a part of, that bridge is always there for you so that the connection can always be there. Families engaged in research is such a spectral thing um, because there's so many ways of engaging. And a lot of people are living a very stressful moment, and that's the reason for engagement. And they may not have the resources or time to spend researching and studying and trying to find answers and connecting, and, and sometimes time's not on our side. To enable an individual to either find their resource or connection that they need, or to maybe open a door to something else that will enable them and their family and their standard of care is incredibly important. To have something that is non-denominational, I, I have no stake, this individual, this bridge has no stake in the care provided or the care received or finance, it really is just a resource of connection and that's imperative. People see research as this outside of the box, so far beyond us, we couldn't possibly be a part of this, whereas actually following and, and checking out a survey and reading through that on something in, in regard to digestion, for example, could open up such a phenomenal door of more resource and connection or perhaps a different path that you didn't know you were looking for. And connection that is really imperative. Um, we all need that. And we all have individualized needs. There is no way to have a standard of individualized care that will just be able to provide it to anybody and everybody. But if we could have a bridge that would allow you to provide the information that you require and that bridge can connect you to the services you need, that's imperative. That, that's great. Thank you so much, Jamie. So now I'm going to turn it over to Donna to, um, to carry on with the questions. Yeah, you know, that's a great segue to um, our next question, which is, how do you envision the future of family engagement in research? And what do you think are the main impacts of it? And Rachel, I'd like to ask you this one. Sure, I think that uh, when it comes to how, the quality of how we do um, engagement in research really ends up kind of lying in how, how do we build, build the village that surrounds the subject matter that we're working on. Um, part of that ends up being considering a little bit of foresight into that as well too. Um, how, what brought us to the family engagement and research course initially as mentioned in one of the PowerPoints was the uh, uh, parents participating in research Facebook group. And it basically what it started off as attempting to do was to bring researchers and parents together in an accessible format in a common ground and I joke with some people as well, too, that this is essentially collaborating and partnership in your underwear. You know, I, I would sit and moderate sessions with parents and researchers and be giving my son a nebulizer treatment or something like that. Uh, what made that really kind of that effective thing work was this was investing in the community and understanding that um, organi these organizations exist, that they see value in your partnership and that they want to continue to understand how you're doing. Um, as a family, um, they want to ask questions about different projects and things like that, because when somebody pays attention to your life as a family member, that is a humongous deal. And then to add to that is an added layer as well about identity, because I think parents 
tend to be challenged by a bit of an identity crisis because we tend to be seen in a the social model of disability talks about the notion that uh, it's the world around us that hampers and is disabling. And when you think about that from a care, uh, the caring perspective of a parent, um, the current system we exist in is disabling because we are seen more as functions um, and sometimes free labor, all of these things. We, we make up for a lot of what is lacking in the current system right now. And when somebody suddenly says that there is worth, um, that your story has personal worth, that is a significant shift in understanding who you are as a mom, because it's not just the typical parent, standard parent um, textbook, if you will, but it's more um, a whole other aspect, be it medical, be it physical, you become a part-time occupational therapist, all of these little pocket identities that we tend to carry through our lives, um, but yet we still see ourselves as functions. And so when that function be begins to have merit, you begin to see uh, a bit of strength within yourself. And I see that with families that I work with um, through the Family Engagement and Research course as research engagement strategists. I work not only with researchers to, con to discuss what it means to um, essentially m move projects forward in an effective way and authentically, but also with parents as well, too, I can say that what um, I would love to build capacity to have these wonderful conversations that we have with families. I can say I've had personal meetings with parents who have felt like they didn't see their worth, much like Ali was mentioning before, and, or their abilities and, and were doubtful as to where their place at the table. And it was wonderful to have, and some of these Zoom meetings that I'm on with families end up being moments in tears because they are just truly wondering who they are in this giant space that we've created that says suddenly you have value. And so I want to be, um, in the future, I want to see more families um, have that opportunity to connect, to engage and to see that collective value as well too. And together we can build a system that, that makes sense and that, that builds healthy lives and healthy foundations for everybody involved. That's just wonderful, uh, Rachel. We all, I think we all have th th that goal in mind, and I think the whole panel would agree um, uh, t to your statement. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just noticing that the time is really ticking, um, and we had some questions uh, from our audience, and there was um, one that I really want to pose that really stood out specifically, um, and it comes from researchers who... Uh, a researcher in the uh, in the audience who asks, "Is there something specific that researchers can do um, to make you, we, us, as family members, um, feel valued and feel like partners or equal partners uh, in the research process?" Um, maybe I want to uh, ask Ali. Is there something? you know you kind of addressed this earlier in your in your response but maybe you can you can talk to that what what can researchers do um a very very uh simple way that i've learned how to level the playing field and ease some of my personal anxieties is to ask people their first names and i have found um throughout my experiences both in acute care settings and in research that um, Dr. So-and-so with the 17 letters behind his name who's been in school, you know, for 37 years um, is really intimidating. But when he says, my name's Tom and I'm one of your team members, it really creates a relatable bridge. We all have a first name and we're all just people. And um, that's a really simple way. I am not saying that I am not respectful or don't want to acknowledge that some of my team members have huge educations and lots of expertise and experience. I'm just saying that when you want to connect with me, I don't have those things. That's not a connection. Wonderful answer. Anybody else want to want to take that on? You don't well mind. Said. Said. It, it, um, came in, was super nervous. Basically, the, the first researcher that I connected with gave me a hug. I thought that was um, the first thing to kind of take away that stigma, that really basic thing 
that's like, oh, you know, this person is smart and also a human being. We, I, a lot of the families I work with seem to have that real severe power differential or comprehension of what that power differential looks like. We, we honor the positions that um, scientists do work within, but at the same time, uh, when we can humanize that partnership, we're, we're going to create more successful relationships. So well said. What a perfect way to end. <laughs> yes, so much so. And now I guess we're back over to Brian. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. Very rich discussion. And thank you, Donna and Connie, for uh, bringing us through a, a fantastic conversation. Uh, I, I somehow missed out on the opportunity to say that Donna Thompson is a caregiver. She's the author of The Unexpected Journey of Caring. She's a guest on White Park. And uh, she's an activist. She is the mother of two grown children, one who has severe cerebral palsy and medical complexity. So she's coming at this from many different uh, points of view. And Connie Putterman has been involved in advocacy and advisory roles for autism research and neurodevelopmental community in Canada since 2000. She's participated in numerous disability and inclusion initiatives, research projects, and research advisory committees for numerous health research institutes across Canada. You know, they, they, they led a great discussion. Um, I want to also thank uh, our participants, the course participants uh, of this astonishing course in family engagements and research uh, and researchers and, and, and all the effort that's gone into it and the detail right down to teaching about ethics and, and how to go forward and how to build communities. I just thought I was astonished by the whole thing. I want to thank uh, our three uh, graduates uh, Ali Martins, uh, Jamie Lawhe Winkler, and Francine Buchanan, who made so many uh, great observations about the course, uh, and, you know, as a bridge, a framework for 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 parents, for families to tell their stories and engage researchers. You know, connecting more researchers with more families, demystifying the process of research uh, for non-researchers. Uh, and and uh, uh, and 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 then that reminder that research and service are intertwined, so it's actually a bridge to both. I just you know I just think that there's so much. This this conversation was so rich, and I just want to thank you so much for for bringing it to us today. 